Hi, I'm Tim Tyler, and this is a video review of this book, Evolution in Four Dimensions, Genetic, Epigenetic, Behavioral, and Symbolic Variation in the History of Life, by Eva Jablonka and Marion J. Lamb. Um, so the story of this book, um, I got it because I was interested in the topic of inheritance in evolution, basically. One of my interests is um, the explosion of cultural um, inheritance that's taken place on this planet recently, and its general significance in biology, which doesn't seem to be widely appreciated currently. Um, so um, here's a book on inheritance, and um, I thought it would be of interest to me. Um, I formed an initial um, rather negative impression of the book. Um, it's full of kind of cartoons and um, has a whole bunch of... There's one cartoon, if you can see that. And then a cartoon on the next page. And then another cartoon on the next page. Um, anyway, um, lots of cartoons and also a large number of dialogues as well. Um, so it didn't strike me as a terribly scientific book straight away. And one of the first things I did was um, look up um, memetics in the index of the book. And I read what they had to say about that subject, which is a subject I was interested in. Um, and they laid into memetics um, mercilessly, um, didn't show any sign of having tried to create a sympathetic reading of the subject. And yeah, attack straw men and just generally created a quite negative impression in me about the author's understanding of the topic that they were discussing. So um, that bumped the book down my reading list um, several steps, but it gradually worked its way back up to the top again, and eventually I started reading it. And then my second impressions um, came around about page six, so I'll read from that. The idea that there is a gene for adventurousness, heart disease, obesity, religiosity, homosexuality, shyness, stupidity, or any other aspect of the mind or body has no place on the platform of genetic discourse. And um, when I got to that point, my kind of eyes rolled up in their sockets, and um, I thought, oh dear, um, these authors um, don't seem to know what they're talking about. Um, the kind of the terminology of a gene four, um, just to give you another perspective on it, here's this man talking about the subject. Um, he writes, together with Professor John Maynard Smith, I recently took part in a public domain public debate with two radical critics of sociobiology before an audience of students. At one time in the discussion, we were trying to establish that to talk of a gene for X is to make no outlandish claim, even where X is a complex learned behavior pattern. Maynard Smith reached for a hypothetical example and came up with a gene for skill in tying shoelaces. Pandemonium broke loose at this rampant genetic determinism. The air was thick with the unmistakable sound of worse suspicions being gleefully confirmed. Delightedly sceptical cries drowned the quiet and patient explanation of just what a modest claim is being made when one postulates a gene for, say, skill in tying shoelaces. Let me explain the point, and then Dawkins goes on to explain the point for a number of pages and then writes... Given that our field of interest is adaptive behaviour, we cannot talk about the Darwinian evolution of the objects of interest without postulating a genetic basis for them. And to use a gene for X as a convenient way of talking about the genetic basis of X has been standard practice in population genetics for over half a century. And um, if you're writing a book on inheritance in biology, um, you're kind of supposed to know that, I would have thought. Um, and these authors just didn't seem to con convey the impression of knowing what they were talking about to me at that stage. And anyway, I plowed on with the book. Um, and did improve somewhat. There was a discussion of um, Lamarckian inheritance and a discussion of directed, in, directed variation or d directed mutations, rather, and discussions weren't too bad. Um, and then we got on to um, epigenetic inheritance, and um, I kind of hate the modern redefinition of epigenetics. Um, as far as I'm concerned, epigenetics is um, C.H. Waddington's term from 1942, and it's been uh, mercilessly, mercilessly hijacked by a whole bunch of new biologists um, who um, don't have a clue about um, what terminology um, should mean as far as I'm concerned. Um, for me, um, kind of epigenetic inheritance is a kind of contradiction in terms, because if it's genetic, then genetic is defined as being um, something that um, is inherited, basically. Um, so, yeah, I don't, don't approve of their attempt to um, redefine um, Waddington's terminology. Um, but anyway, um, that's a bit of a side issue, really. Um, I'm in a bit of a minority position on that subject. Um, and the other thing to say about the, um, the discussion of epigenetic inheritance in this book is that it's kind of probably a bit um, written a bit too early, this book. It dates from 2005 and there's a whole bunch of um, kind of scientific studies in the next following few years all about um, kind of um, methylation and um, histone proteins and other 
aspects of inheritance that are related to DNA but aren't actually part of the DNA sequence itself. Um, so the the discussion of epigenetics in this book kind of draws on a whole bunch of hypothetical examples and kind of thought experiments, and it's kind of not very convincing because they're not actually referring to the scientific literature on the subject as much as they kind of ought to be able, ought to be doing. Um, so. Um, and the other kind of problem with um, epigenetics that they don't go into um, is that it's quite significant um, how much information is inherited. Um, nobody really doubts that um, inheritance in other ways apart from DNA is a factor in biology, but one of the issues is whether or not enough information is transmitted and with enough fidelity to produce cumulative adaptations. And although they provide kind of um, anecdotal evidence and discussion and um, studies that indicate that um, inheritance isn't confined to DNA, um, they don't go into the point of um, how much fidelity there is and across how many generations the information is transmitted. And that's a completely critical point as far as I'm concerned. Um, it makes a huge difference to the nature of the resulting biological systems, whether or not you've got a high fidelity copying process or a copying process where the information drops out over a period of time and doesn't uh, kind of accumulate and result in adaptations. And um, they should address that issue and they don't really. Um, and then um, the next chapters were about about um, cultural inheritance, basically. They divide it into um, symbolic variation and behavioral variation, and behavioral variation, um, well, Another kind of the, my critiques of this book is that it talks about dimensions and I've got a mathematical background and for me dimensions are things that are orthogonal to each other and um, their epigenetic inheritance is a kind of dustbin category that covers all the other kinds of inheritance apart from genetic inheritance and then they have behavioural inheritance which isn't really orthogonal to the previous category at all, um, it's included within it and then um, they have symbolic inheritance which is surely a subcategory of behavioural inheritance which is a subcategory of epigenetic inheritance, um, according to their term terminology. Um, so um, not really dimensions at all. The whole book is mistitled or uh, using dimension in a, um, not in, in a non-technical sense or something like that. So um, don't really like their categorization of things in terms of um, dimensions. Um, and the sections about cultural inheritance and symbolic inheritance are kind of OK. Um, the authors um, have a lot of examples. Um, they've actually studied the issue in some depth. And they've written another whole book um, entitled um, Animal Traditions, um, which is probably a um, better book than this one. This one has a whole bunch of other stuff in it as well, and the sections on um, symbolic and um, kind of behavioural inheritance, or what I'd call cultural inheritance, um, are quite good. Their um, authors playing to their strengths in those areas. So um, at that stage, my um, impressions of the book perked up a bit, and I decided it wasn't too bad. Um, I got the impression throughout the book that the authors were kind of um, trying to pretend to be authoritative and um, weren't, didn't kind of have a sufficiently good background to be able to put it off very convincingly, so it was kind of like that they were putting on a, an air of authority um, when they were writing, which was kind of slightly amusing to me, um, you, seeing somebody trying to be authoritative when they don't actually quite know what they're talking about is kind of a um, slightly amusing thing. Um, and. Yeah, the the other um, aspect of the book was that their attempt to be authoritative was kind of undermined by their use of cartoons and dialogues. Um, so, again, that um, just struck, struck me as a bit amusing, basically. Um, anyway, not too bad. Um, I kind of um, had my initial negative expectations um, boosted quite dramatically, and by the end of the book I'd learned quite a few things about the um, animal traditions. They gave me a whole bunch of examples that I wasn't familiar with, um, so I did get some stuff of a value out of this book. Um, however, um, one can't help thinking that um, a better book could be written on the subject, um, so um, a number of drawbacks, but um, yeah, still worth reading in many respects. Um, so um, enjoy.